Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mokalever and thank you for joining me here at the start of a new campaign into you know the Lasses of Europe before the update for Toolbox Theory drops. In which, as you can tell, we're not starting at the beginning of the campaign, it's 1966 and I've already gone ahead and played quite a bit of Yatka here. But, we have right in the Okrana. Although the Okrana, ably led by Boris Sminsevsky, has undoubtedly been effective in recent years. They've also caused us problems in times of war and crisis. Their services are vital, and over those, mistakes can be overlooked. But in times of peace, this is no longer the case. The excesses of the Okhrana can damage the public support of the government, and so it will be made clear to Smilsky they will no longer be able to, or permitted, to operate without supervision efficiency. We'll be hampered somewhat, but it is not a small price, but it is a small price to pay, to ensure that anger is not redirected towards the government nor the Tsar. Also, the last one plays Vyatka, which was the very first campaign I played in TNO. I went authoritarian democrat. This time, no matter what happens, we are going to try to get liberal democracy. I've not used consequences yet in this campaign, but I will have I will if I have to to make sure we can go liberal democracy. Um, and then we're going with a partisan problem. Well, we defeated our enemies. We didn't kill every last one of their supporters, unfortunately. This was resulted in a number of partisan holdouts that stretched from Akhangalsk in the north to Samara in the south, the patchwork of fortresses, bandits, and leftover. Disenfranchised soldiers, all believing in a myriad of ideologies and owing loyalty to one man or another. Communists, fascists, and even radical democrats are present in these holdouts, even. Even if they weren't even raiding our caravans, attacking villages who have professed their loyalty to us or slaughtered soldiers when they get a chance, they'd be presenting an issue, but right now, they're rampant. We'll have to deal with this problem as soon as possible to ensure that the Tsar's rule is secure. Okhrana reigned him. Alexei and Alexandrov, newly hired agent within the Okhrana's Internal Affairs Division, entered the nondescript building, proceeded to his office, and sat down behind his desk. The morning's case has already arrived. As he read the files, he silently gave thanks once again that the division had been further expanded. When he... When he had begun, there were far, far, far too many cases for himself and the other investigators to pursue, and he knew that malfeasance had subsequently had got, often gone without punishment. While the case was still heavy, even now it was manageable, and that meant he could pay another or pay proper attention to those cases assigned to him, such as the current one, describing shockingly negligent actions by one field agent that had cost the state millions of rubles and injured three citizens besides. Seeing that the agent in question was a repeat offender, Alexei recommended him for immediate interrogation and began the arrangements for a likely dismissal. He looked back at back at the other stack of cases beside him. It was going to be a long day, in which we are right now campaigning for these guys over here, um, the KDs, I think it's the cadets, uh, let's see, we're campaigning the re your regions, minority voting, we're doing that, unification of Russia, we can wait for that one, society development, we're doing the best we can here, um, but yeah, 32% uh, is not bad, and, and then root them out, versus offers of amnesty. The partisans are provi providing or proving to be more difficult to defeat than was previously anticipated. There are too many of them, and they are still well too concealed in the vast forests that dot the sovereignty. We must take more drastic action. Yet to simply use more force would be counterproductive instead. Let us offer amnesty to do any willing to come forward. The hardliners will refuse, of course, but any wavering compatriots will not, and as more amnesties are granted, the bands will become more, both less able to conduct major operations and more susceptible to defeat by local forces, leading to victory over the long term. So we can campaign a little bit more. Encourage minority voting. Yeah, that'd probably be really good to do because VNS is very strong in a lot of places. Trans Volga. We are very weak in a lot of places. Probably, let's go Trans Volga. Yeah, strong. Very weak. Yeah, we gotta go. Uh, encourage minority voting and then Trans Volga. And we'll do this stuff. I mean, this, this does, doesn't give us social development or anything like that, so it's kind of okay to ignore, ignore those. Let's see, where are we for this as well? We are 5.7, 1.12 billion. Not bad overall. Oh, the Indeed Slend. Look at that. That's a lot of liberal democracy support. But the GGR, led by Daddy Herman. Finish off the SS. Oh, boy. Ah, Brugandy. The problem with partisans. On a tip on a tip from informants, Andre Bobrov led his men to the cottage outside of Pem, searching for subversive elements, arranging themselves for entry. Andre hefted his rifle and kicked in the door, striking a man who'd been standing behind it before rushing inside with his own men closely following behind him. As he did so, he saw that he had clearly interrupted a meeting, and seeing one of his attendees begin to raise a rifle of their own, he held down his trigger. The fire fight was brutal, and thanks to the effect of the automatic weapons in the close quarters, extremely brief. When it was over, Andre counted six dead partisans, among them a boy no older than fifteen. He swore to himself, killing boys, likely themselves forced into participation, was not part of the plan, but it was what had happened, placing sentries outside of the cottage. He and others got to work, searching for documents, messages, radio frequencies, or anything else that could lead them to other groups. We're to come down from top to focus on looking for such, and Andre was not a man to disobey orders. This is just beginning the Emperor's peace. Though hard work and focused effort, we have managed to pass by many of the partisan bands that have plagued our nation. Though bandits and criminals have always existed, uh, an extent to a large scale does ornament a consequent rise in both popular and confidence regarding political support of the government. 
We can now turn our other attention to one of the other many matters not requiring attention. Confident that, at least internally, our security situation has been rectified. Yeah, Viaco is absolutely, like, my first campaign in TNO, so... It's weird coming back and actually knowing how to actually play TNO in Russia. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't show you guys at like, the beginning, but it was it was okay. It wasn't too bad. It was kind of... Some places were really not great, but still. VNS is doing really well. How is VNS doing so well? How is conservative democracy doing so well? In the Urals. I don't understand. Uh, I hope we win here, man. Even then, we might not still be able to win. We'll see. Uh... Urals again, maybe? Very weak, very weak, very weak, huh? I hope we win. Oh, it would suck if we didn't. Anti this campaign, VNS is oh, a bunch of cheaters over there, aren't they? I mean, this gives us more level democracy support anyway, so we'll see what happens, but... Mm, not feeling too good about that. And we're still building ourselves up. An olive branch. Deep in the forest on Arkhangos, Captain Pavel Karelovich Shepovalov sat hunched around the fire with his men. Pavel had served under the WRF since the Russian War, and when the Tsars had taken his hometown of, of Arkhangelsk, he had vowed to end, uh, fight to the end, even after the marshals forced to surrender. It had been easier first. The Tsars' forces were overstretched and unable to cope with the guerrilla war that he and other remnants of the Red Army were waging more recently. Imperial forces had been reinforced and bolstered with new weapons and veteran troops. As a result, raids on Imperial supply lines had gotten more and more difficult, as men were starving and their weapons were running dangerously low on ammo. So, when one of his men handed him a letter from the Tsar himself, he didn't immediately throw it in the fire. Pavel broke the seal on the letter and began to read. To the valiant soldiers of the West Russian Revolutionary Front, even as we are at odds, I can help but feel a sense of true admiration for your valor and tenacity. You continue to fight against all odds long after any reasonable man should or would consider your job done. I know that you have no reason to trust in the imperial system, the flaws of the old empire, where many of the people suffer greatly for it. However, I must ask that you lay down your arms for the good of the Russian people. The future of Russia is at stake, and in order to lessen the harm on the people we must reconcile. In the interest of peace and unity in the empire, I offer to you and all of your compatriots amnesty against all charges that could be leveled against you in exchange for your surrender. You my word that I will not show any harm, or allow any harm, to come to you. Signed, Tsar Vladimir III. Pavel stared hard at the letter and his hands as he weighed his opinions or options. In the end, it was the hunger that nodded at his gut that forced his hand. He threw the letter into the fire and called for his men to assemble. The war, their war was over. You can't fill a stomach with ideals alone in the Imperial Recovery Committee, because we still have to wait for this up to fire too. For the establishment of the sovereignty, we can no longer rely on a vodka distiller to provide a significant portion of the state's budget. We must instead develop and execute an integrated economic plan on a national scale. To do this, the Tsar has announced the formation of the Imperial Economic Council, which will assemble experts from both the nation and the emigre communities, and tasks them with overseeing such development and implementation. Through intelligent and consistent planning, the economy and industrial base will grow, improving the lives of ordinary Russians while also preparing us for the eventual campaign of national unification. So here we are, pulling update, oh boy. Uh, that's looking pretty good. Research is looking pretty decent as well. Agriculture is looking very nice on mass mechanization already. Like, I would focus on that quite a bit earlier. Uh, poverty is doing okay. Industrial equipment is looking pretty good with rudimentary factory lines, which obviously could be better, but whatever. Wow, we were 52%, that's pretty nice. And then, industrial base, expertise is looking pretty good. Professionalism is, eh. But, you know, whatever. Encourage minority voting? Why not? Just in case. We get over all the political power today, so which is not bad. And it looks like Amsu is doing quite well, I would say. Quite, quite, quite well. The 66 election results. As the Congress of Vologda, Vologda progressed, the delegates from the various factions made their voices and positions heard. Each tried to influence the will and build the support of the Russian people. Each was given a chance to speak. And each believed in their heart that they would be victorious. The Constitutional Democrats... <clears throat> Better known as the cadets and under the leadership of the eternal reformist Rahman Gul, pledged to make Russia a place for all of its peoples. Though Russian and non-Russian alike, they promised regional autonomy, the respective cultural and religious tradition, and the liberalization of the Tsar's regime, believing that to do so would create a state that all could be proud to be part of. The conservatives, under the leadership of the old imperial bureaucrat Vasily Shulgin, promised to return to the values of the Russian Empire. They vowed to ensure strength and stability under the guidance of a strong and centralized government watched over by an equally strong and authoritative Tsar. The Solidarists, under the leadership of the firebrand Alexander Solzhenitsyn, offered an alternative direction. Based on the anti-communist thought, they pledged great victories and new glories for Russia and her people. Under the guiding hand of the Tsar and his government, at the end of, as the end of the Congress grew near, the millions of votes cast across the sovereignty were coupled, and the delegates waited with bated breath. The votes are in! A democratic empire! Oh! Oh, you better not end my run here already! Uh, do not send nukes down here. Are, are you kidding me? You better not send nukes. But, a democratic empire. Far away from the Congress of Bologna, in the city once known as Param, Alexander Medved, 
Medvedev said in front of a small radio, the former Red Army soldier and partisan had resumed his life following the defeat of the monstrous Aryan Brotherhood, which actually was easy to take out, hanging up his rifle and returning to his previous occupation as a lumberjack. Having now lived under two failed and brutal regimes, he was willing to give the so-called Tsar a chance so far as much as he could tell. The Romanov, Axion, had done right by the people of Russia. As attention was returned to the radio, as the results of the Congress were announced, a victory and a surprisingly clear majority for the cons Constitutional Democrats, or cadets. Medvedev had not expected that. The Soviets had long taught that monarchism was inherently and inexorably and reactionary. Instead, however, this new empire seemed to be marching in the opposite direction, towards liberalism and democracy. He was not yet sure what to make of such a change, but he didn't know that well, he was looking forward to seeing something, seeing what it truly meant. With that thought, Medvedev finished his tea and went to bed. It was a new day tomorrow and he had many more trees to cut down. A new day for Holy Russia. Did we do it? Did we actually do it? We did it! Victory for the cadets! Oh crap. The US is going to- Oh, why? Is this the beginning of the end? Oh, no, 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 no. Of course, MIV, I could run, it would happen. To the surprise of many, especially in a monarchist state, liberalism had triumphed at the Congress of Vologda. The Constitutional Democrats, better known as cadets led by Roman Gul, have secured the majority of delegates and will soon form a government. My apologies about this. Oh, my goodness. 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 The cadets have declared their intentions to institute reforms they've long championed, and tend to focus overwhelmingly on prom promoting social mobility and personal freedoms. Although the relationship between Gul and the Tsar is likely to be an uneasy one, the Tsar has accepted and supported the electoral results. It's not yet certain, however, whether this nation at large is prepared for such a drastic shift in governmental priorities, and Gul will have to work hard to prove their worth. He's a liberal democrat, we lose political power, we lose military factory construction speed, but get more civilian factory construction speed. Alright, interesting. Please don't nuke the world, for the love of God. Begin the reform. After years in political wilderness, the cadets have, against all odds, secured a governmental mandate. Invested with that uh, mandate, they can now act to implement reforms considered long overdue. Alongside many other reforms, democratic principles will be enshrined and expanded, and market regulations will be loosened. Although this will draw the ire, reaction, and conservative elements alike they will see in time, the value of empowering the ordinary Russian with dignity and freedom. For if the man is empowered, so too is the nation. Alright, how do we do here? What were the votes like? Oh, please don't lag. Oh, don't tell me we're going World War Three. Okay, it's just, okay. Okay, so we have, look at this. Four votes in total. Six. Oh, boy. Eleven over here. Forty, look at that. Transvolga, Ninsi, Novgorod is looking very good for us. Oh, look at this. Oh, so here it is. VNS was actually really close to us. The NTS was pretty close as well, which is the way we went last time, I think. We went 152. We barely get enough. 41% versus 37% versus 20.9%. Wow. We barely squeaked out. Oh my goodness. Well, that's cool. It's got more political power now, though. Makes me happy. A billion does not make me happy, though, but, you know, whatever. Honestly, we're going to boost it up because we need more output. We just straight up need more output. Uh, Cool. Let's campaign again. Minority voting, yay. You know what? Screw it. Let's get some more... It's not, it's not worth doing it, but like, then election season. The people of Russia have uh, decided. The last of the ballots have been counted, and the winner of the 1966 election has been decided. The victors have made their speeches, thanked their voters, and have begun to focus energies towards the task of governance. Reporters and journalists have returned to the regular crime, scandal, and fluff pieces pushed aside during the election. Party machines have begun shutting down, ads removed, and campaign posters and items put in storage for future use. Soon the campaign will become a distant memory, something for historians and political strategists to look at back on in the future. After all, the plans are already being drawn for the next election cycle for when the whole process will begin again. Cadets and voters, you have done Russia proud. Welfare? Nice. A new era. Roman Gul had been many things, a soldier in the Great War, in service of the Tsar, and a writer and journalist, a concentration camp survivor, an advocate and activist for the democratization of Yakin, and finally the Prime Minister of Western Russia. Strife and warfare had been constants in his life where he really shied away from, yet as he walked down the aisle leading to his Imperial Majesty's suites, a slight feeling of nervousness rose in his chest. As he prepared himself for a scheduled meeting, Gold took a deep breath before entering Vladimir's bureau. It was like entering another world. One frozen in time, relics of another age presented all around who he... He who dared enter. Imperial furniture striking Roman's gaze. And there was his liege, sit at the desk and seemingly had been awaiting the Prime Minister's arrival. Your Imperial Majesty, he said, in accordance with the Imperial etiquette, I trust that you're doing well today. The Prime Minister Gould. Uh, Vladimir retorted in a formal tone. A slight migraine, but nothing more or nothing too serious. Please take a seat. I'm sure you have much to tell me. Gould ex executed himself. As his thoughts raced in his mind, Roman started elaborating on his reform plan to the Tsar. 
as I evoked in the past, your Imperial Majesty. We cannot go on with how poorly regarded for personal freedoms are in Russia. The people, Russian and non-Russian speaking citizens, is and should always be our priority. Each and every one of your subjects deserves better lives, brighter, brighter futures, and though much has thus been, been done under your reign, absolute rule and austerity measures can, alone cannot be the norm forever. Now that Western Russian is stable, I come seeking your blessing and help in the enacting a better tomorrow for our countrymen. Lest we fall to chaos and infighting again if these words cannot reach us. Gul wasn't wrong. Western Russia was under complete control, and those pesky austerity measures could be loosened, if not removed entirely yet. The wary middle-aged Tsar, minding to keep a composed facade, can help but be somewhat worried of how far Roman's reforms will go at the expense of the crown's power. You have my blessing, but an empire of equals. With the reforms well underway, the cadets have turned their attention to a population often ignored and oppressed by the government and citizen alike in equal measure, ethnic minorities. In keeping with their principles of equality, a legislation has been introduced that will extend official recognition of and protection to the various minority groups within the state. All the peoples of the empire are, in truth, Russians. An attack on the rights of one is an attack on the rights of all, and thus this will no longer be permitted. Reduce the strain on the government? Good. As it should. Boost, baby, boost. Uh, 90% is really nice. Let me just do all this. I'll come back and fill them all out. And we're doing this right now because this is my last campaign to box theory. Ooh, I'm not gonna know what to, how to balance the budget at the time of this, well, soon after the time of this recording. Because I don't know what the toolbox series is going to be like. I have no idea. The devs didn't want to give... An, I don't know. They might have given early access to people, but... Obviously, if you're reading... Reading this. You're watching this video after toolbox series comes out. You know what happens, but like... I don't know. That'd be cool if the devs gave me early access. Some devs actually do give me early access to mods, but... I probably pissed off too many, uh... Devs. From TNO in the past. My bad. Um, as the victor celebrated the mourners mourn. Losers mourn. Many polls, uh, which were a staple during the election season, have quickly faded from the forefront. While some continue to run, measuring public opinion on everything from voter satisfaction to the latest scandals, most have been shuttered away in the next election cycle. The many lessons learned from this year's election polling will soon be applied at the start, or the next, as experts and amateurs continue to look for ways to improve upon accuracy and reduce bias throughout the polling process. Hopefully they'll be more accurate this time, next time around. The Imperial Constitution. <clears throat> With the close of the historic Congress of Alagda, the selection of a cabinet and the appointment of a prime minister and a governing party, the time has come for the final step, drafting the constitution. This is not something to be taken lightly, as this imperial constitution, the founding document of the Russian monarchism, will define politics and the state for years to come. The eyes of all are on the delegations as the debates, of course, begin. More output, please. One point four three is not bad, but could, of course, be better. Could be a little better. Oh, also, like, we won't need to go to war with, uh, the Euroleague. Because Omsk unified and they're probably not going to break apart. If they do break apart, we can go to war with the uh, Euroleague and Warnberg, but, uh, they will, these guys always, always are forced to attack these guys, and which means we'll defend these guys. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and then kill them off later. An empire of equals. We are all Russians, my friends. Ferdinand Gimatov sat with his friends around a table in his home, the radio. Played soft music, and the five friends sipped tea and talked amongst themselves. Timur, Ferdinand's brother-in-law, shushed them as the music cut out and the national anthem began playing. They all heard of the cadets' victory in the election, but then, and they had even voted for him. And they were excited to hear what the newly sworn-in prime minister had to say. The radio cackled and hissed as the anthem was replaced by the voice of Prime Minister Roman Gul on this most auspicious of nights. It is my honor to stand before all the people of Russia as a representative. I've been elected with the expectation that the people of the Empire, be they Russian or otherwise, be given the treatment they deserve. The Empire of old was plagued with chauvinism and hatred for the minority populations to help make it strong. We have a chance, and here now, to build a better state for all of the people of Russia. Ferdinand listened to the Prime Minister's voice with a sort of detachment. The words he spoke were all well and good, but they were the same words he had heard for generations. Timur looked most excited. Even if he had heard it all before, he was always most optimistic of them. The Prime Minister continued, As I speak, a series of initiatives are being drafted to ensure the liberty of every citizen of this empire. On the floor of Parliament, laws enshrining the rights of ethnic minorities in the empire are being passed. The days of Tatar and Bashkirs being discriminated against for the faith and customs are over. We are seeing the beginning of a brighter future for all the myriad peoples of the empire, and it is my greatest honor to help bring the empire to that new future. Timur was even more excited than usual. He would usually call for him to calm down and distemper his optimism, but Ferdinand could not help but be optimistic himself. He had heard the passion in this man's voice. Maybe the future will be better than the past, but an empire reborn. With the Congress of Alagda completed and the partisan situation addressed, the sovereignty has, at long last, and 
with the shedding of much blood, secured both internal and physical political stability. Western Russia had little over a, a little of either for decades, and with their existence now being understood, popular and political support for the government is increasing across all sectors and social groupings. There still remains many problems, of course, but to many they are of less than the fundamental physical security of themselves and their families. And the Tsar can take heart that he has finally provided such to millions of Russians long deprived of it. The empire remade. A new day is dawned on Western Russia, and now known as the sovereignty of Western Russia, and it is of one of peace. The legacy of the Russian Empire, once lost, thought lost forever, has returned, and its efforts cannot be more apparent to the people it now counts among its citizens. Political stabilization has arrived through the efforts of a de democratically elected government and the establishment of an imperial constitution. Internal security has been achieved through the efforts of military and security services in combating bandits, partisans, and revolutionaries of all kinds. As a result, millions of Russians within the imperial borders are feeling somewhat that they have not felt for a long, very long time. Hope. Uh, the sovereignty moves forward into an age where all functional United Russian Empires within its grasp. New challenges will be faced, and the hard decisions will, as always, have to be made, but united both behind the government and the internally stabilizing and benevolent presence of Tsar Vladimir III, the future, of course, is bright. Long live the Tsar and forever onwards, in which we are doing and hiring foreign instructors, as we are currently doing in the Imperial Recovery Committee. If you want to read this again, please go right ahead. So, thank you. Um, let's see, what do we have here? Heavy machinery? Yes, please. Boost it up for now, baby. 22 divisions is not enough. Academic recovery is not bad, but... Mm. Public education. Oh, that's kind of costly. We get more political power, but it's only 2%. Oh, that, what? We get another research... Oh, I forgot we could get another research slot. That's really strong. That's really strong. Yeah, Viaka's really quite developed here, but... Economy's finally shown that economy and GDP growth has slightly increased. Uh, economic recovery first, please. The initial policies of the Imperial Recovery Committee have already shown effect. Although the decreases in poverty and hunger and corollary increases in industrial output and wage growth are as minimal, they're nonetheless observable. But we cannot stop here. There's much work to be done, and the committee's work has only just begun. Still, it is already an impact. Hasn't it had an impact for the better on, on the lives of many of our citizens, and that must be applauded. The status of the economy, which we did actually work on a little bit before... Uh, uh, I started recording because that's the whole thing in like the you know first stage. Although we've emerged victorious in Western Russia through both military and political efforts, this is a cold comfort to many Russians still left unemployed, homeless, and of course hungry. Oh, actually, this is that one, anyways. The economy of many regions outside Vyaka proper were are and remain nearly completely destroyed with abominable living conditions. I don't know if you're about better industrial expertise, please go right ahead. And virtually no advancements, uh, prospects for those living in them. However, at the Tsar's direction, the Imperial Recovery Committee has drafted a comprehensive plan of construction and reform. They pledge to focus on the repair and construction of domestic industry, the re-establishment of a competent academic base, and the introduction of a significant currency and financial reforms. Direct foreign investment will also be vigorously pursued, though it will be very difficult. And require hard decisions to be made. The experts of the committee are confident that if the courses stay, their plan will succeed. They further say that such successes will not only serve the millions of Russians crying out for prosperity, but also provide the economic base needed to reasonably pursue further unification efforts. The Tsar, who himself gathered the committee together for this purpose, has no reason to doubt them. It's time, my friends, to get to work. Academic recovery? Ooh. Ooh, I want to do that, but I gotta get that research slot. Academic recovery? Oh, what do we have here? Oh, the rest of the girls. Um, they're not investing, so increased relations, I guess. That's fine. Everything else doesn't really matter, so. For a very long time, available education in Russia has been a minimal, and when it's been available at all. As our economy continues recovery, this deficiency can and must now be addressed. Without educated citizens, we cannot continue to develop our economy beyond subsistence levels, and so we will invest in it. At the assistance of the Imperial Recovery Committee, a comprehensive plan for the development of a national educational infrastructure from primary to tertiary will be created and the resources allocated to implement it. In this way, we can prepare for the future and leave it as part of our legacy, a generation of intelligent, innovative, and forward-thinking Russians. Reopen the universities. With significant funding now available for education, we must now act to reopen the many institutes of higher learning along closed in long closed in Western Russia. These institutions, unused and unneeded during the many years of division and conflict in the region, are essential if we wish to ensure that the sovereignty possesses the means by which to generate the next generation of administrators, industrialists, researchers, and more besides. An inventory of campuses will be completed, and reconstruction priorities will be subsequently ass assigned. Once in operation, we are likely to notice both an increase in our ability to develop innovative solutions or of or improvements to problems. Oh, and there goes some other guys. Agriculture, don't really need to do that too much, but we'll do it anyways because we can. Race for the murals? Nice. How is Omsk doing? It? Are they falling apart yet? No. Lesson from the gauntlet? Cool. We're almost there. 50? Nice. Improve relations? Improve relations? Yes. 
very nice. Oh, we're gonna lose so much. Ah, the brain train. Our academic base will slowly start improving. Nice. Next up, Yaka. The conductor bellowed the notification over his microphone, echoing throughout the train as it chugged along. A man with a teenage daughter who slept on his shoulder could be seen in one of the seats. This was Mikhail Valtsevich. A Russian emigre, just like the others on board of the train, as the train kept chugging along, Mikhail would chuckle. He never expected to be back in Russia with a daughter. He had fled during the Civil War with his family, now he came here for a new life for himself and his daughter after the death of his wife, and so, here were the two on the brain train, filled with emigre scientists, bound for Vyaka. They come through Akhangol, so the only safe way to get to Vyaka due to the recent wars. The train screeched to a halt suddenly as the conductor told the passengers that their train had arrived at the destination. Mikhail woke Alexandra up, and the two walked off the train. Snow fell onto the train station as Alexandra turned to her father, saying, So this is Vyaka, huh? Mikhail nodded, saying, yes, it is. Did you ever come here in your youth? No, lower-class people rarely went outside their local area when I was a boy. Alexandra soon moved around the station, taking in the falling snow, as, as she said. This is the first time I've ever seen snow in my life. Was it was it always like this in winter? Yeah, snow pretty much all falls here every year. The two remained silent for a moment before Alexandra finally asked, Do you think Mom and Babu would have been glad we did this? Mikhail paused, trying to figure out what he was going to say next. He looked to his daughter, a tear rolling down his cheek as he said somberly, I, th I think they would, if we were happy, I am, but are you? Alexandra, a faint smile on her lips as a tear slid down her cheek as well, replied, Yes, I am, Papa, I am. And so the two embraced each other in the falling snow. But we care more about the Kazan, or Kazan Science Academy. Oh, there they go, see? The Russian Academy of Sciences was, for many years, a preeminent educational institution in the Empire, producing many great inventors, engineers, and thinkers, and cultural icons. The Academy is now far beyond German lines and utterly inaccessible. To complete our plan of academic revitalization, we'll complete the new, new now lost institution with a new one. The Tsars decreed the construction of a new ca Academy of Sciences, this time in Kazan. With time, patience, funding, and well some luck, it'll become a beacon of advancement and proving to the world that Russia is no longer a backwards thinking nation. Yeah, the devs definitely put a lot of love into uh, Vyaka here, and it shows. Because if you play, if you follow my channel at all, like I've played almost every, pretty much every single Russian warlord, so you can definitely tell that they, they put a lot of effort into Vyaka. They put a lot of effort into all, all these, you know, nations, but like, this is, this is just details that they have for Vyaka compared to some other nations, just. You can tell they're there, so. How long do we have to wait? Because I want the guys to get really involved down here first, and they're actually pushing out. Okay, that's nice. Uh, we can afford to stay back. Last time we invade as well. No. We'll, we'll strike Umsk. Get them really balls deep into the Euro League in Orenburg. Let's go in. Nice. Also, uh, I did try, want to try something else out here, so. I was looking at the Reddit, because I do often look at the Reddit. For inspiration and well, maybe not for inspiration, but just for, just for fun, and to see if there's any updates, which finally there are. Uh, also, we did go earlier with getting special forces in the focus tree, but uh, this, this time I decided let's go with lead infantry. I heard they're better than normal infantry, so we go with normal infantry. We lose breakthrough, soft attack, hard attack. We get better supply, but lose organization, HP, and piercing. Well, it does cost a little bit more, but I decided to go with lead infantry. So so far, it seems like it's a good choice. So far, at least. The loss is 7,000 versus 2,000 from us, huh? That's not good. Oh, we've, we've looked at 9,000. Nice. So far, of course. Nice. Two political power days is a lot. Industrial recovery would be very good. You know, let's get that just to get that going. Actually, how, how far are we with this? Expertise? Oh, let's definitely do that one. Industry in Western Russia is not yet even fully recovered from the German bombing campaigns, let alone the devastation inflicted on the regional unification. Their Imperial uh, uh, Recovery Committee has therefore identified the fundamental reconstruction of the extent industrial base as a primary objective, in order to permit its contribution to further efforts and projects. Funding has been dedicated in order to ensure that reconstruction is completely as completed as quick as possible, but this is the first step towards a rapid expansion, but it must be taken nonetheless. Never again, no, not like this. Keep spending. Spending is cool. They're aligned with us. Good, as they should. Oh, how, much, how much manpower they left? Oh, going about better research facilities. Please go right ahead. They don't have that much, which is good to see. Kind of doubt they'd be mobilizing more anyway, so... Yeah, not really much there. 
Please tell me the South African War is over. We don't need nukes to be flying. We've lost 18,000 versus 85,000. Not bad. End of the South African War. Okay, what happened down here? Piece of last. Ah, uh, oh, America lost. They got involved, declared war, and they still lost. That sucks. I'm glad we're not them this campaign. The Thinking Man's Empire. Oh, look at that. We got him. Nice. Tsar Vladimir III stood on the steps of the newly opened Imperial Academy of Sciences in the city of Kazan. He now looked over the crowd before him at the faces of the future of Russia, the next generation of Russian intelligentsia prepared to start their journey into the sciences. The Tsar took a deep breath before he began to speech. As I look out among you, I see the future of my empire. Oh, the empire, whoopsie. Each and every one of you is chosen to embark on a journey to explore the depths of the sciences. You will be driving the driving force behind the evolution of Russian science. The bears of the torch of progress. Vladimir paused and made a point of looking out over the crowd once Russia boasted the finest scientific minds in the entire world. That scientific tradition survived the Great War. It survived the Bolsheviks and will thrive in this new era of revitalization. These, there are those who would call the Russian people barbarians and savages. That we have nothing to contribute to the scientific community. These people are the greatest fools of them all. We'll prove them all wrong by rebuilding the great community of science within our empire. The Tsar's speech came to its end and the crowd erupting into applause. The students in the crowd were excited to begin their path into the world of the sciences. Many of them had been born in the anarchy and were, while more well off than most, unable to acquire more than a simple education. Those of the nobility were better prepared for the days to come, but even they were less well off than their parents had been. The faculty were best prepared of them all. They had all been a part of the old intelligentsia and remember the days in which Russia were a le was a leader in the sciences. If they had anything to say about it, the scientific community would beg for the attention of the imperial scientists again in the near future. Science as a Russian institution. How do we add them to a lead? Oh, we need more influence. We're almost there. So that's fine. So, did we not get the fifth research slot? Did we? Were we lied to? We were lied to. We didn't get it. Oh, wait, never mind. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Oh, yeah, we made a tangle. Look at that. Oh, and probably that's going to be the end of uh, Goring there, because actually fighting Switzerland is insanely difficult. Like, I do not recommend it. It is god awful. Oh, right, a vampire. Look at that. Go figure. Oh, well. There you go. There you go. Ah, they're in us here. Nice. The Wit Currency Reform. The epitomous Wit Currency Reform, named for the member of the Imperial Recovery Committee who designed it, Council Minister and member of the Imperial Recovery Committee who suggested it, focuses on both the introduction of a single centralized currency and the mandate of it as the only form of legal tenure within the sovereignty. Also, act to combat the continued use of regional currencies, inequalities in purchasing power stability, and black market transactions and exchanges besides. The result has been promised to be after an initial period of disorder as the system is converted and over increased in coordinated economic activity. Oh, we can do Russian reunification already, but there's literally no point to do it because we still want to get through all these focuses, so. And we want to get all those free bonuses when we just, like, prepare for war against Omsk, even though we already killed them off. But invite foreign capital. In addition to as many other problems, one issue facing sovereignty is a near total dearth of foreign capital investment. Securing such investment would allow for the pace of economic development to be rapidly accelerated, and as such, the Imperial Recovery Committee has asked both the Tsar and the Foreign Ministry to reach out to foreign powers both near and far and offer significant incentives in order to promote investment. While doing so certainly have significant economic benefits, numerous side benefits, including increased foreign recognition and a more rapid decrease in unemployment, they have also been identified as key contributors to do so. Uh, let's get some better planes, why not? Anything else here? Integrate. Good. Integrate, yes. Still get point eight. It's not bad. This is a, you get a lot of political powers, Vyatka. It's kind of ridiculous. I love it, though. The open door. Reorganize the Ministry of Finance. Ooh, we get medium taxation. We lose a lot of political power here. Ooh. I don't know, man. How much are we spending? Oh, that's quite a bit. Uh, can we cut down on spending? Not really. Honestly, not really. I'm not going to cut. I'm not going to bolster it, but I'm not going to cut it. Uh, I don't want to lose any more money, though. I uh, can't do that one. If you want to do that one, please go right ahead. Uh, if you want to read this one, please go right ahead. Economic liberalization is not bad. Ooh, poverty could rapidly improve. How far are we on poverty, though? Uh... Would we be able to get that poverty done and get to the next level and then do this stuff? And then when it gets to the next level, go ahead and choose this one. 
Empire's prospering again. Rapidly improve. Maybe? That's definitely a maybe. I don't want to hurt our political power gain and political and construction speed. And factory output and stability. I think we can wait for that one. Rebuilding the civilian sector. Or making money. Shouts filled the air as printing machines that were working as fast as they could be. Hurry this up, shouted Boris Skosirev. I noted how slow this operation was moving. The more we print, the more money I have. I mean, we have. If you don't meet the quota, you know what happens. I'll be out in my office. Closing the door behind him, so he could have at least some quiet. Boris peered out of the window to watch his workers. We were motley poor and unemployed peasants who could do nothing else. He just hoped that they could execute his perfect plan well enough. This was his best idea yet. I knocked came from the door and assistant walked in. Sure, we may have a slight problem. They changed the design of the, the 500 rubles. Uh, so we're going to have to throw it all those out. They did what? Boris yelled. Let me see the new design. Tricking it over. Boris assumed as he noted how the new design was entirely different than the old one. Go to everybody that will be working overtime for the next week. I also want the old ones burned so we don't have any leftover evidence. Yes, of course, replied the assistant. Oh, by the way, you might want to check the 1,000 rubles this guy printed. The assistant handed him one of the notes. Is this supposed to be Vladimir? He looks like a little girl. Boris tore the ruble into pieces and threw them into the trash can. One last thing, the guys just found out they printed Nicholas's head upside down, or upside on the 5,000, don't worry. They only printed a couple thousand before they got caught. Just let him have his fun, man. Just let him have his fun. Owing to our previous efforts towards both reconstruction and extent industry and constructing new infrastructure corridors, we can now take efforts to expand the civilian economy. Through strategic spending as well as the provision of attractive subsidies, we can encourage the construction of factories focused on the production of domestic goods. The value of even the most basic amenities in ensuring societal stability and public support of the government should not be underestimated. And by encouraging their creation, we may not only obtain that support, but increase employment and domestic product besides the open door. When do we integrate them? Hmm. Uh, education? Why not? Russia was so effing cold, those were the thoughts of Wallon Anderson, the American PR representative from Anheuser Busch and the makers of Budweiser. He was here to strike up a deal with the Imperial government to gain an exclusive license to export Vyaka Vodka to the US. Just like how Budweiser was a default beer of choice to the American public, Vyaka Vodka had become the vodka of choice to the West Russian public. The hope of Anhoys or Bush was that if they secured an exclusive license with the sovereignty, they would be able to corner the cheap alcohol market in the US. That is why they sent Wayland, for he was one of the few PR people who knew a bit of Russian. Wayland had never been a Russian and only knew Russian due to the fact he studied it alongside German, Spanish, and Italian. Used to the warm summers and mild winters of California, Russia was like a slap in the face to uh, <clears throat> him with its winter. It wasn't helped by the locals in Vyaka, as always. Just They just always stared at him. He guessed that most had never seen a foreigner in their lives, and they were clearly hesitant around him. However, that did not matter, for Wayland was here for the vodka, not the people. He eventually arrived at the Vyaka distillery, being greeted by a large man, shouting, Greetings, my American friend. Welcome to Russia, where Vyaka drinks you every day. Wayland looked at the man, asking, uh, What? The man looked confused for a second before shaking his head, saying, Oh, sorry, my friend, I meant you drink vodka every day. My English is not so good, I'm sorry. No, you are. Suddenly, Wayland would be hugged by the large man in a nice, warm, bear hug, sighing. Wayland thought to himself, My goodness, can I go back to my office, please? But what if that hug is really... Oh, look at that. Everyone about that, please go ahead. What if that hug is really warm? We had your old guard training. Ooh, that looks really good. Special forces goes up. Yes. Yes. Look at all these guys. Thanks for becoming uh, these guys. Thanks. Um. Oh, crap. Mm, I guess Borsk first. Uh, doesn't matter. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, as much as I would love to, like, convert all these guys over... Um, to like, or just delete them for manpower. We cannot. We're gonna need a big old army when we fight the Germans, because we will in, uh, use the second West Russian War mod to take out the Germans as Vyatka. This ballooned up our debt, our budget really. Oh, look at that map. The political part, though. Oh yeah, that's nice. Political thought. Eh, eh. What, 2 billion? 2.6? 6? That's what I thought. Yeah, that makes sense. Reevaluate the armed forces. The performance of the Imperial Army is in securing the territory now composing the sovereignty is laudable, and should be recognized as such, but this should not mean we can overlook the potential for improvement. In pursuit of national unification, it will be a long, hard trek to the Pacific, and we must be ready. We will therefore begin a thorough examination of our campaigns and once again make unified decisions on our overall strategy for the development and expansion of the Imperial military, as we did once before. That examination enabled us to achieve victory, and this one cannot but do the same. Ah, Puyi was a good man, but he's gone now. Oh, well. And when in doubt, just keep making more things here. 
Good. Boosting this up, making us bigger, stronger, faster, more powerful. Nice. Learning from the Western Reclamation. The triumph of the Western Reclamation, the establishment of the authority of the Tsar over the region, was a great victory given to us by the Imperial forces. In order to ensure that upcoming campaigns of national unification are similarly successful, we will examine the Western campaigns in great detail once again. In doing so, we will learn where officers, men, equipment, and doctrine excelled, and also where they were found wanting. Though it will be difficult to admit our failures and identify avenues towards improvement, we must do so for both the future of the sovereignty and the future fortunes of the Tsar. Absolutely. Poor research thoughts is overpowered, man. Oh, maybe not overpowered, but like that's. We're not leaving a lot here for people to do well against us. Which is fine with me. Like, I want us to do really well, but. Look at all these templates. Goodbye. Cut them down for now, because we, we're going to need that manpower. Because we're just going to convert them to, uh, like, 40 combo width. So. And we're out of manpower. But what else do you expect? Core, 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 baby. How much gun are we out? A lot of guns, anti-tank, and artillery. Holy crap. Kind of should have seen that one coming. Status of the armed forces. The Imperial military performed admirably in the campaigns to unify Western Russia, but the campaigns to come will be very different indeed. Vast distances, extremely varied terrain, and stronger enemies will be encountered, and the military must be ready to encounter them all. We must conduct a comprehensive inventory of our efforts to date and identify needed avenues of improvement. We must decide decisively upon a unifying doctrine for our formations. We must build public trust and support. We must establish support units. We must expand production, new train new officers, and update our equipment besides. Clearly, there is much to do, but we are determined and dedicated, and we'll address each issue in turn. No painful examinations and admittances will have to be made with each will come with improvements. And when we reach the end of this long path, we can be confident in our ability to carry the Tsar's banner all the way to the Far East. Boots in Siberia by 72... Honestly, probably earlier. Yeah, probably earlier than that. Let's be real here. Earlier than that. Look at this button. We're doing really quite well, I'd say. Especially these guys becoming 40 combo with. We like it. We do have some tanks. I mean, they're five and five, basically. What we would call five and five. Five motorized, five you know, tank, tanky boys. But uh, honestly, 12. Um, so we're going to go to 28. We're gonna do it like that. So this way, now we can duplicate this and call this. SP artillery, because if you get, if you really work on SP artillery, they can become extremely strong, and I really recommend everyone try to max it out at least once to try it out, because I was not a big believer in using SP artillery, but after using them, it can, sh it can, not always, but it can shred through enemies, like, it's just insane, it's just insane how much armor you can shred through, and how much flesh you can sh thread, th th flesh, th th go through, words are hard, man, especially when you're excited, construction, ah, screw it, we'll do a construction, why not? That's why I don't want to lose political power. Two a day. That's so good. Do we have any more plannings, too? Share the wealth. Sticking to our guns. Ooh. That's not bad. New schools of thought. Well, let's get new schools of thought. That seems like the way we should probably go. Some time ago, we considered orienting our military towards lesson learning and from studying the approaches of our other nations such as America, Britain, Germany, and Japan in the same time since though. We've acquired vast new ter territories and industrial bases within them, and we're, which are critical to the production of the equipment needed for the modern warfare. As a result, and despite the objections of some of our more traditionalist officers, we will decisively choose to orient the Imperial Army towards specialist training and recruitment. While this is likely to cause a reduction in recruitment efforts owing to the stringent requirements of such programs, it will ensure that those same specialist formations are capable of performance beyond what others, which might otherwise be expected. Nice. Celebrating the heroes, of course. And the old Imperial Army is nothing without its valiant soldiers, the men who could and did give their lives for God, country, and Tsar in the campaigns of regional consolidation. We must make the st stories of those heroes known. In doing so, not only will our current and future soldiers be motivated by the stories of those who came before them, but efforts to promote our campaign or campaigns will simplify. The general populace cannot but support the aims of our military, once made aware of the many stories of the noble action and sacrifice contained within. Absolutely. How's the budget looking? Even though we need more millies. Oh boy. State welfare. Oh, I love it. Help out with that poverty so we can max out poverty later on. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Celebrate them heroes. The Russian Imperial Navy. Combat schooling. So we get more attack and defense. 
army professionalism goes up. Yes, please. Discipline is key in any military. Without it, soldiers cannot be relied upon. Soldiers may disobey orders, and larger tactical and strategic plans are doomed to failure in the past. We've noticed several displays of ill-discipline within the Imperial forces, and while that might have been once been acceptable, it is no longer. Accordingly, we will reorient our military's training program to place greater emphasis on discipline and unit cohesion. By doing so, we'll ensure that when the company's east, uh, campaigns eastward begin, the integrity of our formations will remain, even over the vast distances that will be encountered. Absolutely. Yeah, there's not really much, no re reason to invest in the Navy that much. I mean, first of all, we're playing Russia, but still. Mm, more daily political power, why not? Screw it, let's get it. So now we're getting 2.37, which is not as good just spending 50 political power for no reason, but whatever. <clears throat> yeah, I was working on these planes. My goodness, they're not very good. That's not good, that's not good, that's not good. Oh, that's, that's not too bad, though. We got a lot of main battle tanks, which I'm not going to take anything off of them because we need to keep them. With this ability, we could work for Manpower would not be bad. Ah, do it anyways, because we can. I'm feeling generous right now. I'll spend our PP. Extend the PP. 2.51 billion is not bad either. Not bad at all. So now we're at 5.75. we got to wait quite a few months. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Yeah, we've, oh, we have, this is what we had the same thing we had earlier. But now it's a permanent thing, which is nice. The wealth of Orenburg. Nice. Keep boosting it up so we get more PP, because we're going to spend a lot of PP. When in doubt, PP comes out. Oh, the creation and deployment of specialized formations, such as the Farewell Bridge Burners, during a regional conquest proved highly effective in achieving victory. It has therefore been proposed that we expand these formations. This proposal will be accepted, of course. Through direct investment, we will optimize the structure, doctrine, and mature requirements of these formations, and thereby promote the creation of even more of them within the military command structure. When the great campaigns of national unification begin, they will facilitate our advance towards victory through the acts of great skill and daring for which they become known. Absolutely. Let's improve the artillery as we're here, too, so... We'll go with five first. The Imperial Russian Navy. Or we could do this one, too. Establishing contacts. Yeah, we're going first. With establishing the political stability of the sovereignty established, it's now time to do something that no Russian state has done in a long time, and begin a coordinated and global diplomatic campaign. We have many resources to offer the world, and we need just as many advancements and investments in return. Serious investment were required in both the establishment of reliable diplomatic infrastructure as well as a standardization of treaties of recognition, trade, and external representation. They will, be, of course, be made. Russia will no longer stand alone on the world stage. Oh, yes, this, this is one I like a lot. Helps increase the GDP growth. 6.9 is not bad. All right. You. Come here. Mikhail Antipin, I think you're from St. George, I think? I can't remember, maybe. Max out that attack, I don't care who it is. Panzer later, yes. Actually, that works out really well for us. Um, nice. The Imperial Diplomatic Corps. In order to achieve our diplomatic goals and open our nation to the world, the sovereignty must have a capable and professional diplomatic corps. Sufficient investment will therefore be made to ensure that we do. The Imperial Diplomatic Corps will be prioritized in order to ensure that it attracts the best and brightest and center around the world. They will secure advantage for the state. Our agreements of diplomatic recognition, trade, mutual protection, and perhaps eventually, global alliance can and will be pursued in doing so. Russia will prove again once again that it is at least a regional power and it should be negotiated with as such. Nice. So we've got all this stuff done. Get some better fighters and stuff. We're gonna work on artillery, of course, like I said earlier, but just 3.21 billion, that's a lot. Ready for diplomacy. With the internal polit political situation and the sovereignty stabilized, we can now do something that Russians have not done in many years, look outwards. We intend to try and form relationships whenever we can with both new friends and old, prioritizing both diplomatic recognition and trade relationships. Legitimacy, critical for claims of the rest of Russia, can be obtained through connections with both the Organization of Free Nations, as well as a number of European monarchies. The more positive relationships we can build, the stronger our nation will be. For each new treaty, agreement, understanding, and friendship, Tsar Vladimir demonstrates his leadership, and thus his right beyond bloodline to rule over Russia in its entirety. The sovereignty is open for business. Yay! European Overtures. Here with the OFN. Uh, connecting our realm. It's not bad to get either. 
Uh, European overtures, why not? Europe has long been a continent of monarchy, even if the Reich that now occupies so much of it despises even the concept of the institution. Some monarchies remain, however, and owing to his possession of the Grand Romanov bloodline, are Tsars connected to many of them through old marriages, alliances, and partnerships. These relations have lied dormant for many years, but it's now time to revive them for the modern age. We will, using the incredibly experienced persons of the Imperial Diplomatic Corps, open relations with these countries, establish mutually beneficial initiatives, and cement our status as a regional power, dreams of further expansion notwithstanding, of course. The Imperial Diplomatic Corps. As an ostensibly legitimate nation, the sovereignty must open up to the world, both in venturing out and in allowing others uh, outsiders or others in. But to do this, we need the skill and experience to do so. That skill will come from the Imperial Diplomatic Corps, newly formed the Imperial and Governmental Decree. The Corps will act domestically and otherwise to improve both the image and the connection of the sovereignty to any who are amenable to either. They will also, however, and of course, focus their efforts within needed on specific goals, regions, and nations that are provided to them, and some such focuses of attention are under consideration. Should the competence and our inter inter international position develop sufficiently, it may even be possible to develop or open dialogue with other regimes occupying Russian territory to the east. It may sound farcical, but if unification could be achieved absent bloodshed, it would be a very worthy goal to pursue. Diplomacy, of course, is essential. Trip to Madrid, or trade with the OFM. The OFM is a natural global counterbalance to the alliances of the Germany and Japan, both of which, even if the crimes against the Russian people were overlooked, will count among our greatest rivals once the national unification is achieved. As such, alignment with the bloc will be useful not only currently, but also in the future. We can begin doing so through the, through the establishment of unofficial trade agreements, with cargoes funneled uh, through the port of Akahongolsk. As we grow more comfortable and trusting of each other, we may lay the groundwork for the future collaboration. Who knows what the future may hold? Primary schooling? Probably a smart idea to have. Agricultural mechanization? Why not? So now we're seven. So this is why I wanted to wait. Because I don't mind improving society or poverty now. But if we wait to get the bonuses to poverty, that would be extremely good for us. So, so this is 50 to 80%. And then eventually we will hit 25 and 50% eventually. I can pretty much guarantee you that. Ties to other royals. The historical connections and relationships, familiar or otherwise, between the Romanov dynasty and those of other European monarchs who remain on the thrones offers the state a unique opportunity. By leveraging these new relationships, along with utilizing friendly and migrate networks and the expanding membership and expertise of the Imperial Diplomatic Corps, we can be in a coordinated campaign to win the support from other countries. The, <clears throat> though they may, in most cases, not hold the direct authority that Artar does, they are still a monarch, and among all monarchs there is a common bond. Consequently, efforts in this direction will begin. Sooner diplomats will be dispersed through the old capitals of Europe, hopefully to great effect in reestablishing both the reputation of the sovereignty and the value of commencing relationships relations with it towards mutual benefit. And, oh, I don't want to do this. I'm, gonna, I'm literally going to say this one for last. I don't want to get hurt of pee-pee. So, let us end uh, with this one, but an embassy in Washington. As part of our efforts to integrate and ingratiate ourselves with the OFN and thus the Americans, we will act to achieve formal diplomatic recognition by the U.S. as a legitimate Russian government. Once so achieved, we will petition them for the right, as well as any other legitimate government, to establish an embassy in Washington. It will not be an easy goal to achieve, but we will focus the entirety of the diplomatic core resources on it. Achieving recognition from the Americans will tremendously strengthen our claim to the Russian lands on the international stage, permit greater economic and trade opportunities to be explored, and cannot but allow for more cooperation with them in the years ahead. Very true. Uh, we'll read one more after that one. <clears throat> and one. Trade with the OFM. The OFM, or the Organization of Free Nations, is a global alliance that we look forward should pursue. Looking forward should pursue. Germany and Japan are natural allies and enemies of Russia, and in opposing them, the OFN naturally becomes attractive. In return, we can offer them not only resources, but a potentially a friendly nation cl closer to the enemies than they. As such, we should begin pursuing a positive relationship by establishing trade agreements with the U.S., as well as other OFN members. Industrial expertise, military equipment, and connections further afield are all potential outcomes of such trade, and all will be useful to our new and growing nation. We should, however, remain vigilant. Moving too quickly could push the Americans away, and such a result would be much a disaster, as one could be called. Perhaps we could even join the OFM one day, but how about we do a trip to Madrid and get wild with it? It's been decided to focus, focus next the efforts of the diplomatic corps in Iberia through the dispatchment of a mission to Madrid. <clears throat> As a major regional power in Europe, but also with itself united, untied to the German power bloc, it is an ideal candidate for the establishment of favorable relations with our nation. As one of the members of the Corps who both speaks Spanish and possesses experience in Iberia, our diplomatic mission will be led by one Boris Skoyesirev, former Tsar's representative in the Brazniki government, though some have raised the concern that his troubling past and Andorra could compl complicate matters. Uh, Skoy Sirevs has dismissed them. Time will tell if it's the correct choice, but if you enjoyed this episode, leave a like.
subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we will continue on with our another campaign of Vyaka and his liberal democracy. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous rest of your day.